Good afternoon, good evening. Uh, welcome to this event, jointly sponsored by my school at ASU and the Arizona Chamber of Commerce and Industry. I'm Paul Carice, I'm the director of the School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership here at Arizona State University. And we are delighted with this partnership with the Arizona Chamber in a series we began last year and are continuing this academic year on the future of Arizona democracy. Tonight's discussion is addressing the particular topic of balancing ballot access and accuracy. Our school at Arizona State University, our department, has a multi-year speaker series called the Civic Discourse Project. And that's devoted to featuring civil disagreement and high-level discourse about important issues of our time in academia and beyond. And you can find more information about the school and about that speaker series. Uh, there's some information outside and also on our website, scetl.asu.edu. We have the same spirit for this partnership with Arizona Chamber, the Future of Arizona Democracy series, um, to bring experts from diverse perspectives to address important issues about Arizona, our politics, our state's constitutional and civic culture. So we'll have two main parts uh, to tonight's event, a panel discussion, and you can see the panelists here, with distinguished experts, both Arizona and national experts, and our distinguished moderator. And then in the second part, you can see there's a microphone here near the stage. We will take questions from the audience. And we invite everyone really to stay for part three, which is the reception. And we hope you will stay for further conversation. So it's now my pleasure to introduce Mike Bailey, who is the general counsel of the Arizona Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And he, in turn, will introduce um, one of the student organizers of the event, Joe Kutz, uh, to introduce the panel. Mike Bailey, before coming to the chamber, served as the United States Attorney for the District of Arizona, and prior to that, as the Chief Deputy Attorney General for the State of Arizona from 2015 to 2019. And we also are proud to say that he is a Sun Devil. He graduated long ago from an institution called the ASU College of Law, since renamed the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law. So please join me in welcoming Mike Bailey back to ASU. Hi, I just wanted to take 20 or 25 minutes to uh, <laughs> uh, welcome you on behalf of the Arizona Chamber of Commerce and Industry and the Arizona Chamber Foundation. It is an honor to uh, co-host this event with the School for Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership. Uh, it is a, a, in a real sense that Dr. Reese's school and the chamber are two peas in a pod. Our, the chamber's focus is, of course, uh, you know, in, in relation relates to Arizona policy and, and making Arizona economically prosperous for all of us. Uh, and uh, importantly in the environment of business, and of course the school has a broader focus, but uh, we are looking for the same thing, how best to uh, apply ourselves to public policy in the state. And so uh, it's an, again an honor and, and Paul, the partnership we, ap we appreciate very much. I will say this, uh, if, you know, the best way to measure a school probably is on, on the basis of the products it produced. And I have been at the chamber now a short while, but I have had the opportunity to work closely with uh, quite a few of the School for Economic Thought, Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership. That's a mouthful, I will say that. <laughs> but uh, quite a few of the students, and to no end, they are impressive. And I can only commend you all for the product that you're putting out. One such student is now in his second year with the chamber as a student, first as a fellow, and now managing our fellows and interns. Uh, Joe Pitts will introduce the event. Thank you, Mike. Uh, I really appreciate it. Again, really appreciate everyone coming out this evening. We really appreciate it. Uh, and thank you to those of you who are online as well. We know many of you have uh, chosen to attend online as well, so we really appreciate that. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about is a little bit about myself and then basically talk about the fellows and then the most important part, introduce the panel. 
So my name's Joe Pitts. Uh, I'm the program director for the Junior Fellows. In my second year uh, on that, and I also have a double major in business management over in W.P. Carey, and then in civic and economic thought and leadership here uh, with Skettle. So very grateful for the partnership. So again, I'm going to speak to you a little bit at the Fellows first. And so at the core of the Junior Fellows, I like to say there's a simple belief, and that's that the next generation of Arizona leaders desperately needs an institution and several institutions to refine their abilities, grow their connections, and promote civic engagement. And so the fellows are all students, right now all here at ASU. Uh, and I'm sure you've been acquainted with a few of them. They were the people who were uh, wearing these shirts all day. So you probably saw them in a few of your classes if you're in Skettle. Wonderful. Um, the fellows are students, and I like to say both in the broad and narrow sense of the word. As uh, Dr. German liked to point out to me today, we are all lifelong learners. So, <laughs> And we care about civic education, enterprise, and the future of Arizona democracy. But why care? And a lot of what the fellows have done, too, through Skettle has learned why we should even care about the discussion we're going to have today and about voting and about elections. And that's because, um, quite frankly, we're all in this boat together. And so our own studies in Skettle have shown us that we're all called into relation with others. Aristotle would say we are social beings, right? Martin Luther King Jr. would say we're all tied up in an inescapable network of mutuality. Powerful stuff, but it also applies to our democracy and to our elections. And so discussions about real conflicts brewing within our own body politic cannot be avoided for fear of provocation. We believe that they must be approached vigorously with kindness, compassion, truth, and civic virtue. Partnerships with edu educational institutions like Skettle and Arizona State University are vital for several reasons. Number one being that education is a bridge to the future, pretty obvious. Universities are a hub for some of the brightest minds of this generation and the next. And if you knew me, it's probably a doubtful claim. <laughs> That's a joke, I, I hope. And enterprise and democracy are only on firm ground when the public is enlightened and engaged and equipped for civic life. So the Junior Fellows exist at the intersection between politics and business, civic education and free enterprise. We believe in our tomorrow because we have the opportunity to train our minds and hone our skills today. And so the fellowship has allowed Arizona students to engage in public policy research, meet with industry experts, elected officials, business leaders, many of whom are on this stage uh, and others who are also in the audience. So we hope you continue to stay up to date with the fellows, attend future installments of this series like we're going to be having next semester, and we really appreciate you being here today. So today we have a panel of experts that are going to discuss a topic that has dominated headlines for over a year now, and those are our elections. And so, or probably longer than that, honestly. <laughs> it's longer than that. <laughs> It's my honor today to introduce our panel to all of you. And feel free to give them a round of applause after I introduce each of them. So firstly, we have John C. Fortier. He is a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, where he focuses on Congress and elections, election administration, election demographics, voting and absentee voting, the US presidency, and the Electoral College. He is also continuing his work on the continuity of government. Please welcome Dr. Fortier. A native Arizonan, Kirk Adams is respected throughout the state for both his strong leadership experience and deep understanding of state policy. Kirk served as chief of staff to the governor of Arizona from 2014 through 2018. He was responsible for the execution of policy, political and operational priorities of state government across 37 agencies, 33,000 employees and an annual budget of $42 billion. Kirk previously served in the Arizona legislature where in 2008 he was elected the youngest speaker of the Arizona House of Representatives in state history. Kirk Adams. <laughs> Lisa Mara has been, with the Co has been with Cochise County since 2012 and was appointed Director of Elections in 2017 after serving as Community Relations Administrator for the Board of Supervisors, overseeing legitimate legislative affairs, although I'm sure legitimate as well, <laughs> <laughs> public relations, grant writing, and management to federal funds, being the election official for Cochise County has proven to be her dream job. She is also serving as a, a second term at the moment as president of the Election Officials Association of Arizona. Please welcome Lisa Mara. <laughs> and lastly, but surely not least, I'm pleased to introduce tonight's moderator, who's been a dear friend and mentor to all of us in the fellowship program. Eileen Klein is the founder and advisor to the Arizona Junior Fellows Program. She served as 35th State Treasurer of the State of Arizona and Chief of Staff to Governor Jan Brewer. She is President Emeretta of the Arizona Board of Regents and a former member of the State Board of Education. Eileen Klein.
Thank you, Joe, and thanks to all of you for being here. It is wonderful to see so many students in the audience. I'm sure our panelists will agree with that. Thanks for your interest in this topic. I'd also like to extend a welcome to our community members, to everyone who's online, and also recognize a former Secretary of State and Senate President, Ken Bennett. Thanks for being here tonight to all of you. We are looking forward to a terrific conversation tonight. So the setup is here. We have, to, just to give you kind of what, what the preview of how the conversation will flow, we have the great privilege of having Dr. Fortier in Arizona to talk to us about his recent work where he surveyed for lessons learned from the 2020 election. So we're going to have him illuminate us about his findings, talk a little bit then from each person's perspective, from their special vantage point, what they've seen, what they've observed. From there, get into a little bit about uh, the role of federalism in elections and how all states do it a little differently and maybe what advances freedom and people's access to the ballot versus items that people want to do to ensure ballot integrity and election safety and where we really want to be cautious and making policy to make sure we're keeping those things in balance. And then of course we always want to save time for recommendations, thoughts about how we would work to build a more perfect union with recommendations and then we want to be illuminated and engaged with you. So the last segment will be reserved for questions and answers. So if that sounds good we will get started and we will kick it off with you. Dr. Fortier, you just wrote a report, it sounds like in partnership with MIT, to the election, U.S. Election Assistance Commission titled Lessons Learned from the 2020 Election. And you covered this great challenge of balancing access and also making sure that everybody could vote during a pandemic. So we're really curious to hear what were the lessons learned, what, what prompted you to be involved in this, and, and what were your major findings? Great. Thank you, and, and thank you to Skettle and, and the Chamber for having me, and thank you to all of you for coming, because this is you know, a topic that you're here on, a, on an afternoon or, or early evening, and you have a special gift coming to you from, from Skettle and the Chamber, and you should look in your email boxes, because that's a, that's a subscription to C-SPAN 7, a new <laughs> channel that covers the personal lives of election officials 24 hours a day, so you're, you're going to be heavily featured in this, so this channel. So uh, seriously, we, we obviously have challenges that we've talked about, whether we've had a pandemic or not in elections. I have this report, and I could read 130 pages of it. I will not do that for you. But let me say a few things broadly about elections, um, a few findings here. And I've had the privilege of working on elections sort of nationally in a, a number of states, including some in Arizona, but I'm not going to tell people here that I'm an Arizona expert, so I'm going to let the Arizona experts uh, speak more specifically about things. But two things to remember about our election system that's very different than the rest of the world. One, we vote a lot. And what I mean by that is our ballots are long and complicated. And we vote on president and Congress and governor and secretary of state, legislator. We vote on the dog catcher or the, or the coroner or ballot questions or judges or we have primaries. You can have a phone book of a, of, a, of a ballot if you're in certain states. And so that, that presents challenges for counting the vote, for printing the ballot, for, for voter attention. So that's one thing. I won't talk as much about that today. The other thing that I think is different about America that, that really is important to this discussion is um, that we are very decentralized in the way we vote. Um, we, of course, have some federal laws regarding uh, elections. Uh, but most of our jurisprudence is at the state level. We have local election officials. Um, and that means we have a lot of difference, not just difference on the, the rules about voting, but difference even in the size of the jurisdictions we have. We have Los Angeles County with you know, 10 million people and a small town in Maine being asked to, you know, 50 people being asked to administer the same election. So there are a lot of challenges and a lot of differences. And, I won't skirt the issues by saying everybody can do everything differently, but I think it is important to note that we are going to have different mixes of these practices. Should we have more voting by mail or in-person early voting or election day voting? Well, we saw some big changes in this last election. I'll quickly talk about them, but, but we're not going away, at least not right now, from the idea that we're going to have some different mixes. And out west, we're, we're definitely doing more, much more voting by mail. Um, some places in the east and south, more, more early in person, others uh, uh, on election day still, less, less so than, than it used to be. But definitely there are, there are some debates that we're going to have that are much more at the state level. And I, again, I don't want to say that we're never going to pass things at the federal level. We do. We sometimes come together. 
but it's hard. And I think you know, mostly focusing on your state and thinking about what's right for your state and whatever your thoughts about the last election, having a good debate and thinking seriously about how you want to run elections is, is very important. Um, second point I'll make just qu very quickly about this last election. Whether you like the results or not, whether you have issues, legitimate issues with how we run elections, uh, we did run it under extraordinary conditions. It's hard to imagine that we were going to run this election where COVID came up in the, in the middle of our primaries. Some states were, were faced with primaries you know, within weeks of when, when we essentially had shut down. That was probably the most challenging thing for states to figure out how to run elections that quickly. But certainly even by November, we weren't back to normal. We had to figure out other ways of doing things. And despite all those challenges, we had an election with the highest record of modern turnout by, by quite a bit. Um, that's an accomplishment. Again, that doesn't mean that if you agree with that, that you agree with every decision that was made or think we shouldn't change some things. But we did that. And, and I, want, I do want to give some credit to election officials who are, um, again, you can, you can talk about very specific cases. But as a whole, are dedicated public servants who had to deal with all this on the fly. So that was, that was a very difficult challenge. Um, one of the challenges we had uh, was, of course, how do you make changes to elections for emergencies? And I think there, I don't know if there's an answer, but we really did face difficulties because who's in charge of running elections in a state? In many ways, the state legislature has real powers and passes laws, but there are secretaries of state, there are local administrators, there are even governors or health directors who's, who might Im impact this. And we saw a number of these battles in the states where not all of those institutions were run by the same party. And did we, should we change to open up or change rules for absentee ballots or not? Sh how should we do it? Should we do it quickly? Was it done the right way? Um, that was something that I think was very just difficult for us to get our heads around. And hopefully a return to some normalcy will, will be a little bit more of a normal process. But I, and I think s many of the arguments we're having today are partly about those things. Were these last minute changes made legitimate and are they lasting and what are we gonna do after, the, after that? Um, I will say maybe two more quick things. We, we had a number of findings and I think our findings are, are I don't wanna say they're boring, but they're, they're less, they're more, um, they're, they, they don't get into the hot button issues in a way that I, I'm sure we'll get into later in the day. I mean, I think one of, the, one of the issues we had that was really highlighted this election was and we probably need to find a way, and, and both Republicans and Democrats and their preferred policies might have some changes they need to make, of trying to be able to count our votes, yes, accurately and thoroughly, but also more quickly, to get results more completely in the hands of people sooner. Um, partly, we have a difficult time in a presidential election because, and I wrote a book on the Electoral College, and I'm actually giving a talk tomorrow, if anyone else to come and get back again. Um, we have really tight dates on, the, uh, on that, and so we have to resolve these elections much more quickly. And so finding ways, one example, perhaps there's a controversy, should we find a way to process absentee ballots a little earlier? Well, not count them, but, but begin the process of, of sifting through them and figuring out who, which ones are, are eligible or not, or maybe even opening them and, and putting them into machines ready to be counted on election day. Uh, that might be one part of the solution. The other part of the solution might be to try to get our ballots in quicker, to get them in by election day, which some states do and some states don't. Those are both controversial um, in both parties, but we do think this election showed that it is helpful for voters to be able to see that most of the votes come in, that the early results, while they're not official in any way, are you know, most of what's there, that there aren't as big surprises, or at least to be more transparent about things that come through. Uh, the other thing, I mean, uh, highlight just, and this is partly in the report, but I think it's just a perennial issue. If I had to say one area that I think we could work on very broadly, and it could take many different forms, is our registration system. Um, we've made improvements to our registration system nationally from very primitive system, I think, that existed before 2000 in Bush v. Gore, where you had you know, lots of local lists. Today, we've, we've got state lists, we've got computerized lists. But there's still really a controversy both about are we comprehensive enough on getting people on the lists, and two, are we doing a good enough job of, of keeping those lists accurate. Um, not that that would solve all problems if we improve that, but it helps with a lot of things. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop there. There's more to say um, in the report and, and nationally, but to put a few things on the table of that 2020 election, which I hope we don't have to face those conditions again, those are some of the big things that I would point out. Great, thank you. And 
I will say that you provided a perfect segue so we can get to Director Mara to give you her on the ground experience of what happened in 2020. And, and I appreciate you touching on many of the areas that we know we're gonna be hearing about it at the legislature for people who want to pursue reforms. But Director Mara, let's, let's kind of take that context and now go into what your experience was in 2020. I think as many people entered into the election, obviously we had the pandemic conditions, but for the most part, it seemed like things were you know, looking up because we'd had those long lines back in prior elections and people had worked hard to put things in place you know, we all like to, we like to have, have our votes convenient, we want them secure, but we want them right away. And so there were a lot of changes made, we felt like we had remediated some of those problems. And then to Dr. Fortier's point about registration, or close to your point on registration, there were a couple of groups who filed with the federal court to say that the registration deadline should be extended. So this goes to October 2020. And at that point, I think a lot of people suddenly woke up and said that deadline's been in place for some 30 years. Ultimately, uh, the, the federal judge approved the extending the deadline. By the time it, our, our current Secretary of State at the time thought that was a good idea, then reverse course, an appeal was filed. But by the time the appeal was filed and the federal, the federal appeals court ruled to stop the additional registration period, some 40,000 more people had been registered to vote. And it seemed like from there, until today, we haven't stopped talking about it. So will you tell us a little bit about what you'd been doing to shore up elections from past concerns since you got into office, and then maybe as things started to heat up in, in 2020, how things looked from your vantage point? Well, thank you for that question, and thank you for um, having the panel discussion. I really appreciate that. So in Arizona, and I, and I tell everybody, other states wish they were Arizona. And I say that sincerely because you can't do this job if you don't believe in the system. You just couldn't. You couldn't put in the hours. You couldn't put up with the nastiness. You couldn't. So we're really fortunate for that. Last year was problematic in that, you know, we plan for everything. We plan for flus. We plan for sickness. These things happen. Nobody planned for a worldwide pandemic in a presidential election. Nobody. So we were fortunate in Arizona, we didn't have poll worker shortages. One of the big issues that we did have was the extension of that voter registration period. Now the other thing that I really like about Arizona law is there are separations of duties and powers. I'm not elected. I'm appointed by the Board of Supervisors who is elected, who can fire me every day. So if you're elected, that's a little bit different situation. No one can fire you. So in Arizona, Voter registration is handled by the elected recorder. They're also in charge of mail elections and early in-person voting. I'm in charge of filing for candidates, candidates who want to run for office, recalls, initiatives, that kind of thing. Uh, poll worker training, finding them, training them, finding in-person election day voting sites, and tabulation of the ballots and canvassing. So that's a really good system in Arizona. But we had record number of turnout last year. We had, the numbers are there. So just record numbers. And in Arizona, again, we've been doing voting early by mail for 30 years, successfully for 30 years. I know that because I've done it for 30 years. So other states that didn't have that in place and tried to gear up quickly, they ran into some problems, but we've had very good systems here. We have a lot of choices for voters, and voters like that in Arizona. You can vote in person on election day. You can go vote early in almost a month, 27 days. You can get your ballot by mail. Those are all important things. But what that extension of the registration period did was the system is very good, the registration system. It can't be, when it's closed, it, it's closed. We couldn't close it because we had that extra 10 days or so, so we couldn't start processing the ballots that had been returned. And boy, were they being returned. They were being returned by the Postal Service. If anybody got ran under the bus more than election officials last year, it was the Postal Service in Arizona, and they didn't deserve it. They didn't, we didn't, but they sure didn't. So those ballots were piled up, and people were like, look, we're going into the state site to check our ballot, and it's not showing it's been accepted because we couldn't start processing those. So we were behind from the beginning of those. We're very fortunate in Arizona too, last year with the legislature, they extended, we had a set period of time. Some states you can't start counting ballots till election day. 
we had a, a seven day window, then it was 10 days, and last year in a bill, there's no limit. So we can start processing those as soon as we get them, and they're accepted and verified. Election results still could not be released until one hour after the polls close, and people that count the ballots never look at the results. Everything is tracked on a computer system. But that really set us back because on election night, almost every county in Arizona has all the early ballots counted. And that didn't happen this year. And in my little county of Cochise, where I have 80,000 voters, we were 12, still 12,000 ballots behind that we caught up with the next two days. But, but that, can, that concerns people. Right, right. That's very, that's very fair. Thanks for that. Thanks for that bird's eye view, and I know we'll come back to talk a little bit more about some of that experience. But I'd like to go to you, Speaker Adams, and just call on you both from your political wisdom through the years and obviously your policy mind. You've, you've dealt with a lot of election laws coming through the legislature. You've really had your finger on the pulse of public sentiment for a long time. Would you just maybe share with us how 2020 differed and did not differ in the electorate from your from your vantage point. Yeah, I think that let's take this then to like the the macro level here and try to understand the the ultimate source of the anxiety over these election results. And I think if you really peel this back to its core, what you see as you see in many other areas in our society today is a balkanization of where we receive our information and who we associate with, largely because of the algorithms produced in the social media world, right? And so I think a lot of people approached election day and uh, they had their echo chamber on social media, um, people they were talking to, and a lot of them became very surprised that the results turned out the way they did because everybody they knew agreed with them or were voting for their candidate. And so I think this produced um, a sentiment amongst large swaths of the electorate that really uh, added a filter to how they viewed the election process. How could my candidate have lost? Because everybody I talked to, I know voted for that candidate. And so I think that's, there is a societal issue that has affected um, uh, our perceptions of elections. I will tell you as somebody who has uh, been on the ballot in Arizona and who has worked on uh, many campaigns from door knocker to strategist and everything in between, um, Arizona's election system has long had a reputation for being very good. Um, as the director said, we've had mail-in ballots since the 1990s. And in fact, we've gotten so good at this over the last three decades that I think Arizona campaigns have perfected the art of campaigning in a mail-in election. I mean, if you get into a campaign, you know exactly when those ballots are gonna hit, you time your messaging, you, you, know, you have your, get out the vote effort, and like I say to our friends on the East Coast, when you know a reporter from the New York Times or political call and they're trying to understand, I say, well in Arizona, it's election day every day for 30 days. And every day matters. And that's because of how we handle our elections. The other thing I'll say is, having been in this now for almost two decades, I hate to um, uh, reveal that too much, Mail-in voting has become increasingly popular. That, like, that's kind of a, kind of a dumb thing to say because that's obvious, right? Um, but the, the, real, the real minority on election day is those like myself who show up at the polls because I like to get my sticker, right? I, uh, that, I, that's a civic ritual that I really like and so I'm happy to get up early in the morning and go to the polls. But people like me are in the minority, and when we have that many people now voting through the mail, and increasingly in recent years, voting with the mail-in ballot and dropping it off on election day, in a close race, it's going to produce these elongated time frames to declare a winner. And what we found in 2020, those elongated time frames created a sort of a festering environment of, well, of well, I'll just say it, conspiracy or what's going on, why don't we know? 
And to the professor's point, I think we need to address that at some point and figure out how we get results out faster, quicker, and of course, accurately. Right, right. That's, that's important. And, and, and of course, context is important. And as Dr. Forte, you've talked about, obviously, if you've seen one state, you've seen one state, as we know. So in talking about Arizona and our long love affair with mail-in ballots, What's interesting is that we know the public seems to support it, but yet they are becoming, I, I guess the, the, the opinions are diverging on partisan lines about the value of mail-in ballots. So for a state like ours that uses so much of mail-in ballots, not just for absentee ballots, but, but de facto how people vote in every election, what, what do you think of that? What, do you, what should we make of it? Well, I'll reveal a secret to you. I is loud enough, and I'll now I'll reveal the secret. Um, that I wrote a book about absentee and early voting back in 2005 or six, when it was not a very exciting topic. It was a pretty academic topic. Um, even gives a long history about absentee voting in the Civil War. I, I highly recommend it to all you. Anyway, uh, the, at the point, uh, that point, we, we saw the, the rise in some absentee voting, rise in early voting. It seemed like a big trend, and it, and it has continued since then. So it's it's been a topic that, that has been with us, and, and we've seen the trends go from really low numbers. If you voted in the 1970s, I think you would have found about 5% of people were voting by mail, mostly for a reason you were sick or you were out of town. Um, Western states in particular have taken it up, but it's also very different in different places. So we've seen this big, big change leading up to 2000, um, where by 2000, uh, sorry, le leading up to, uh, by 2016, over 40% of the electorate were voting either by mail or early in person. and you're right here in Arizona and, and Western states, many of them you know, well over 50%. Uh, but then we saw this very large single election change in 2020, and it was related to the COVID uh, problem, uh, but it also became political, and I think there are some interesting changes, and we have to see what, what lasts. Um, we had, a, a, we, we mentioned the case of the uh, registration. Again, some of these emergency procedures became very controversial because if a state ran elections in one way for a long time, but then there was some reason where we needed some, some relief because of this emergency, who was to say, maybe we shouldn't change what we do? Should we change it at the last minute? Is that for good or bad? And that, that led to a lot of our controversies. Uh, we saw first polarization of Republicans and Democrats on this. Um, it's generally true, and Arizona maybe is somewhat of an exception, that, that probably more of the support or more of the voters, uh, states that, that supported or had a lot of voting by mail were more Democratic. Uh, but when the state opened it up, the people who voted absentee were, were, were just like the rest of the state, right? It, was, it, it didn't matter whether you're Republican or Democrat, you chose whatever you wanted. We saw a public opinion diverging. And I think that was, again, because of the changes, because of the closeness of the election, uh, because of different attitudes about COVID. Frankly, you know, different, the parties had different ideas about was it safe to go to polling places or not? It wasn't important to move to this or not. So this, this did become much more politicized. I, I, will, I will admit in my book, I, I am not as big a vote by mail person as uh, some, but I also believe in federalism, so I think states can do it well. And I also will say, um, and I think Speaker Adams is absolutely right about this, that states that do a lot of voting by mail start to do it really well because they, they figure out what they need to do. They have processes. People get used to them. People tend to like them. Uh, and they take a lot of the issues seriously. States that do 15% of vote by mail, I, I hate to say it, they probably don't take it quite as seriously. They don't check signatures as well. And so, you know, this, I don't want to tell you what to do or not what to do, but it, it certainly was an enormous increase in voting by mail, up to about 45% of the country voting that way from about 24 or 5% and also some increase in voting early uh, and election day really coming down. So we have to decide what to do and I think each state is gonna have a debate about what they go back to and what they return to and I, I think it's helpful that that debate's happening. You know, one other factor I'll note is uh, while it's true, again, as Speaker Adams said, that some more like, people like to drop off their ballots and sometimes closer to election day, one thing we saw was a lot of really early voting, uh, partly because so more Democrats were excited about voting early. They thought they should get out there. So votes were cast three weeks before the election, four weeks before the election. Uh, but for that, we might have had even more problems resolving our elections and, and counting as quickly. So I, I think it's very important to think about ways in which we can do it, because there are states that, that 
have effective laws and have lots of voting by mail and still can resolve their elections quickly. Uh, but it is a challenge when you have a lot of voting by mail and you have to do some things right. And I think having quickly resolved elections that people can feel confident in and transparent about how it's counted is one of the big lessons that came out of the last election in part because of this big increase. And so, Speaker Adams and Director Mayor, I want to open it up to you and say, to, to what do you attribute this kind of diverging opinion now about more vote by mail or less vote by mail? What might account for some of the differences between the parties, if there's anything to be, to be known about that? And you know, what are some things that might give people more assurance when it comes to vote by mail? Um, a couple things I'll, I'll touch on. When you're an election official or you're an early board worker, you get to see things other people don't see. In Arizona, in my county, maybe it's just my county, sometimes I like to think it's just my county, but it's not. People write letters on their ballot. They write notes. They explain why they vote. Don't do that. <laughs> Do not do that. Do not sign your ballot. Don't do that. They write notes like, you suck. I don't know how you keep your job. You didn't do anything to tell us about who to vote for and what the candidates were. It's not my job. So it's amazing, for one thing. The other thing is, people lie. I'm just going to tell you. Sorry. People. People lie. If you've ever gone to get signatures, you've worked on a campaign, you ask people, are you a registered voter and yada, yada. Yes, yes, yes. And they sign the petition and you go back or there's candidate challenge, which keeps me in court a lot. And they eliminate signatures because the person's not registered to vote or they're not that party in a primary. And people, co candidates come in all the time and they're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe they lied to me. Well, I tell you this story because I get a lot of phone calls. You wouldn't believe the phone calls I get and the messages that people leave me and their caller ID shows up. You shouldn't threaten people if your caller ID shows up, right? But we had a lot of people call, and, and I, I, I make light of this, but it's really sad. Husbands and wives, male and females, probably about equally, called to say, are you sure my spouse won't be able to find out how I voted? Those are the calls that we get. No, your ballot is secret by, by default. There's a reason for that. It's, it's, it's public record that you voted, but nobody knows how you voted. And, and that was really, that, I've never gotten those calls. Every year it's a different thing. And um, I'll close up my section real quick with, let's remember the difference between vote by mail, which we have here. It was the permanent early voting list. Now it's the active early voting list. So it's no excuse. You sign up, if you vote that way, that's how you vote. In other states that do all mail voting, it's universal. Everybody gets a ballot, whether you request it or not. You have to request a ballot in Arizona. The recorder will not mail you one otherwise. And there's a recorder in the audience, I see, who will agree with that, <laughs> that, um, that they don't do that. So. so what is to account for this disparity in opinions? I, look, I think as uh, the director and former Secretary of State Bennett and Recorder Richard would testify to is that um, no election, in my memory, has been completely controversy free, right? There is always something. But we did this, 2020 was clearly very different. And um, again, I think that largely reflects um, the polarization of our politics. Um, President Trump at the time, during the summer of 2020, began to openly discuss the possibility of fraud. Um, when you have a leader um, of that kind of stature that openly speaks about um, in ways that undermine confidence in our election system, uh, that's going to have an impact on, on how uh, a certain section of voters feel about that. Likewise, um, if he were to raise a concern or other prominent Republicans were to raise a concern, the polarization would cause some of the Democrat leadership to entrench on the opposite side because that's what you do in polarized policy, politics. If my opponent says X, I'm going to say Y. If he says it's light, I'm going to say it's dark. And, and so our election system, our election system 
it, or the way that we view our elections is directly connected to the way that we view our politics today. And I don't think, I, I, in my view, that is irrefutable. Um, and it's not to say that there aren't ways for us to improve the system. There's always things that we can do better. That's the purpose of public policy, is to improve things. But we can't ignore the fact um, of what the political environment has done to our confidence or lack of confidence in our election system. Mm -hmm. And so when you talk about the disparities and how the parties view this, let's take for example, how do Arizona voters feel about our election system? Well, if you look at the research done on this, there's broad confidence um, in Arizona's election system. But when you look at the cross tabs, you see much less confidence in one party and much more confidence in another party. And independent voters or other voters are somewhere in between, right? So it has become polarized and political and again, it's a reflection on not only where we're at in our political system today, but frankly, you know, where we're at in our society. Right. So, so maybe let's talk a little bit about, and I welcome your thoughts, Dr. Fortia, on what you've seen in other states who do have some expertise in early mailing ballots. I expect we're going to see a lot of this in the legislature next session. Again, efforts to continue to refine the process. I think people, the counterclaim will be it's disenfranchising people from their ability to vote. And I especially want to hear your commentary about voter com confidence and how, how we build that, whether it matters. But to the point, I'm, I'm really wondering, in terms of the technology, I, I'd like to go back to what you talked about, Director Mara. I think it's really important that people do have faith that their vote is secret, that it is secure. Are there technology things today that can be done so that we know that the person who fills out the ballot and signs the ballot form is the person who actually returns it? I think we have some confidence in the person appearing in person. We can get into the debate about presenting credentials and identification. But for those mail-in ballots, are, th are there technological cures or other cures that you think would help assuage people that their vote is counted under their name, nobody else is making that vote in their name, and their vote's being counted? Uh, absolutely. Um, again, Arizona, a leader in so many different aspects, but the vote by mail, there's no excuse or, or no substitute for experience People that have been verifying these signatures, that have been forensically trained, that have been doing it for decades, and it's a tiered system. It's not just one person that says, nope, that's no good. It goes through layers, and, have, and eventually it ends up with the chief deputy or the recorder to decide if that's an accurate signature. But some things that we can do, um, voters can keep their file updated. And everybody here in the audience that's really young, you're not like me who's fairly old now, I don't, I don't, I haven't filled out a voter registration form in ever, but I've never missed voting in an election. My signature is probably not like it was years ago, so I should file and f do a new voter registration to get an accurate signature. We also get a lot of signatures from motor vehicle, right? Because that's how people register to vote. So again, electronic signatures when you're signing keypads, not everybody has that technology to see that. And so people that verify signatures are extremely trained and the bottom line is if the signature doesn't match that goes up through the tiered system, we've got a signature cure period in Arizona. It's three days for a jurisdictional election and five for a statewide. So another thing we should do as voters, and we should make sure our friends do that, make sure that you have a phone number associated, right? And if you fill out your ballot, put your phone number on it because the recorder's office will call and verify that and they do it by the hundreds. I can't imagine how many they do in Maricopa County because I know we do hundreds in Cochise County. And then the, the voter can verify that yes, it really was them. If you move, you have to change your address. We, d we don't know if you move. We know a lot, but we, I don't know that. Um, we can't take it from your neighbor that says, oh, they don't live here anymore. Send that back, say moved. But if you're a voter, people update their library cards. They update their fries and Safeway discount cards. They don't do their voter registration. And I'm gonna say that's pretty important. So those are things that we could do. And then let, you know, let's just be honest. If you get a ballot that doesn't belong to you, don't fill that out and send it back. 
sounds silly, but, and we're lucky because our state has really good laws in place and they prosecute those. We had two in our county that got submitted up to be prosecuted. So it, it's a good system, but we all have to make it better. So uh, a couple of things on, on voter confidence. Um, I agree with Speaker Adams uh, with almost everything he said, but, but I do want to make one distinction. And, and the last chapter of our report takes that on. And it's, it may seem like kind of an academic distinction, but I do think it's very important that people learn more about their systems, uh, understand their systems. And I think they often should have broad confidence that the, the, the election systems are working well. I do think the measuring of voter confidence by polling is very problematic. Uh, one of the reasons is, we know this from long history, the party who wins feels much more confident that the election has gone the right way, the party who loses <laughs> feels that they have gone the opposite way. So if you see an election and you know who won, you're gonna find these poll results that are switched. And interestingly, there, we actually did have more division this time. Um, what, we, what we found was actually it wasn't Republicans distrusting any more than they would usually in an election that they lost, but Democrats were actually off the charts in trusting the election. And, and you know, that was an interesting distinction, but it is a, a, a tricky thing to, to assign voter confidence to these simple polls. Uh, on the other hand, you know, knowing your system and being able to feel comfortable with it and, and you know, not having conspiracy theories about things I think is important as a voter, uh, but I think that's, that's a difficult measure by which we, you know, we shouldn't use that too much. Uh, on this question of um, signatures or checking ballots or integrity in ballots, um, you know, one, again, even though I, you know, probably if I were in a state and I'm from the East, would, wouldn't want as much voting by mail, that wouldn't be my preferred system, but I do think the states that do lots of that have, have really moved quite far down the line of being able to do it well in terms of voter signature check. There are states that do a lot less that don't do it as well. So I think, I think one, there's pretty good mechanisms in place. But we do have some issues that people are asking, again, again, the lengths of signatures of, I don't want to you know, cast aspersions on you younger in the audience, but maybe young people don't have uh, as, as uh, you know, sign things as much, maybe your signatures aren't as good. I don't know if that's true, but, but people say that. Um, question of, you know, is it accurate enough? And, you know, I, th I think there are, there are other ways in which states are trying to address this. Some of them are controversial, right? Some of them are, seem to be more strict. Maybe you send in a, a photocopy of your license or put your voter registration number. Or maybe that's an option, right? Maybe if you want to sign, but you also want to reassure people that it gets through, you, you do that. Again, that may, may or may not be the thing to do. Um, I absolutely agree, though, and this is not exactly the same thing, but again, the, the more important question about voter registration, both from a system point of view, keeping it a, a good system, and I, um, I could say a lot more about that, but one, one thing I often say that, that gets people scratching their heads is, states should invest more in their DMVs. Uh, I know everybody loves the DMV, but it's such an important part of um, the voter registration process. Um, whether you want to have one particular reform or the other, just improving that process, uh, partly they have more money and they keep things well and they have to interact with the voter registration system, but that's, you know, th that sort of thing is very, very important, but also as voters, and you're, you're absolutely right. Voters do have some responsibility for this. They move, um, they, they want to keep things updated. It's, it's really a good thing to do and you know, there's some tools like online voter registration and others that allow people to do that, but uh, that is behind the whole system. It's not the same thing as checking if that person has actually signed or sent it in, but it, boy, it's the foundation for that sort of thing, and, and, and ultimately, I think, is one of the most important things we should just keep working on. That's great, and it, so it sounds like we should infer from your, from all of your studies that we should be let that voter confidence will wax and wane, but process matters in terms of building trust. That trust in the system is what we're after. Can you just elaborate on that a little bit? Making systems trustworthy, and does that come down to process? Yeah, so I'm a big fan of, of making systems trust, trustworthy and having voter confidence. I just think that when we ask poll questions, we get these other things that people are, are speaking about when they answer that poll question. It's so okay. much dependent on whether you win or lose. It's sort of like, do you like Congress? Do you like your congressman, right? Uh, people hate the institution, but they kind of like their local. And, and I, I think when, when you win an election, you're less worried about things. When you lose an election, you're much more likely to find th the problems there. And so we should just be cautious with those types of numbers at the same time 
really trying to communicate and be transparent and have good systems that people can feel good about. Right. Well, there are a number of candidates I know who are concerned now after 2020 and concerns and lack of confidence in some spheres that that voters will just stay home. So, Speaker Adams, as you're counseling people who come to you and might ask, what do I what do I do? How do I be effective as a candidate? How do we be effective as an elected official in that environment? Any thoughts about about what we do? I w make sure that we can yeah. get get out the vote. Well. First off, what I would say is if there's a candidate for office that has doubts about the integrity of the election system, you've got to question their sanity in running for office. <laughs> um, I don't see a lot of candidates deciding or prospective candidates deciding not to run um, because they don't have confidence in the election system. So I think um, that says a lot. Um, but look, in thi this environment, I, look, I think it really depends upon, let's just get you know, sort of real political here. It depends upon what party you're running in, um, in terms of how you deal with this with your voters. Um, because the perceptions are different, um, at least nominally different, um, and certainly perceptionally different, as you expect, particularly as you get into that subset which we call primary voters, right? Um, which is a very different subset than general election voters. Um, so, you know, I, it, it's, it's something that I think that is difficult for candidates to navigate. But I, I want to go back to one, one, one point here that was made and, and just give a, um, I agree with it, but also give a, add a slightly different perspective. I think that what our leaders tell us about the results of an election is incredibly influential to how we think about that election. And when we have mixed messages, um, it can sometimes confuse in voters' minds what really happened. I wanna give you one small example of this. I remember watching on live television Governor Ducey in the Oval Office with President Trump. And I was watching, because I had left the governor's office, I was watching because a colleague of mine, a former colleague of mine, was in the Oval Office for the first time, and I, and I really wanted to watch Gretchen in the Oval Office. <laughs> and I remember um, President Trump at the time saying something about mail-in ballots. <laughs> On live television, in the Oval Office, making a comment about Arizona's election system. And Governor Ducey responded, uh, to the President of the United States in front of the national media um, with a, what I would term a vigorous defense of Arizona's election system. And he said, in Arizona, we make it easy to vote and hard to cheat, right? And I, I, but yet there were two conflicting messages that were going out to voters, and I think that creates confusion. So um, I think what we say as public officials and leaders, whether it's leaders in a party, uh, leaders in a public office, I think it does matter. And I think it does influence how our voters view elections and the confidence or lack that they have in those elections. That's a great point. All right, I'd like to make sure that we open up for questions. So if folks have a few questions to throw at us, if you just use the microphone and uh, please, we're, we're interested in your thoughts. Uh, we always have a rule here that we want it to be a question, so if you have statements, please save those for us afterwards, but we are eager to hear your questions that you have for this esteemed panel. While you're coming to the microphone, let me ask the three of you if you have any other thoughts here, recap thoughts, rebuttals, or anything else, and then we'll, we'll hear from our students. I'll, I'll bring up one. Um, issue that hasn't come up, and it seems, again, maybe inside baseball a bit, but one, one thing in America that we have a very hard determining is how much we spend on elections. Um, the reason is partly because, again, we're ex extremely decentralized. We have you know, state actors, we have local actors, we often have private actors. Um, and I don't expect we're gonna have uniformity of that at all, ever, um, but I think it would be helpful for each jurisdiction um, to try to be as clear as it can about what it spends and what it needs. Uh, because this last election we had, we had this extraordinary need for change and more resources. Um, and some of it was filled by some federal money and that, that's, there's a real debate how much, if, if we should or shouldn't have federal money or what it's for. Uh, we also had some private money and that became even more controversial and 
broadly speaking, I think it would be better if we didn't have to have private money because it has, you know, I, I don't think there was anything that was used for particularly uh, problematic in this election, as far as I know, but it's, you know, it does potentially raise questions of, of uh, conflict of interest. So again, it, it may seem like a, a small thing to think about budgeting and what you spend on elections, and it's only a small part of the budget often, but we don't really know. When, when academics are asked, how much do we spend on elections in America? We have no idea, all right? I mean, we have a big, big range. Um, and we don't really know about the local level. And so thinking again about running a good election system partly means accounting for what you have, what you need, what you spend, and showing the legislature or the, or the board that, that, that funds your elections, here are what we need, here are you know, the important priorities, and this is what we're gonna spend on it. That is not really done as effectively as it might. So a, a focus on that would be a good thing. Great, very helpful. All right, audience, any questions for us? Right here. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I just want to thank all of you for being here today. Um, and I say that other people should do that too because this is no better time to ask these questions. The men in black. Yes. Um, <laughs> so on the topic of election regulation and election law, um, my question is sort of twofold. How important uh, is it that we have photo ID laws, the requirement of photo ID laws? Um, but also on the flip side of things, um, are there particular kinds of uh, voter election laws or regulations, such as maybe photo ID laws, that disproportionately affect voters? And, or can that be measured, right? Uh, so I guess that would be my question. Thank you. Is that Melissa? Could all say something, but yeah. Yeah. Why don't you take it first? <laughs> <laughs> this is a popular question here. Um, I guess what I would say is, look, I, I actually, you asked at one point whether it was very important. Um, I think it is actually exaggerated a bit on both sides of the aisle how important photo ID is. I think sometimes um, people who are for photo ID think it is the reform that's going to protect integrity against all things. I think people who are against it think it's going to be terrible and not you know, keep a lot of people from voting. I think the extremes of that are not true. I think the, the studies really show that it, if it has an effect, it's, it's pretty small or other things are more important. And, and similarly on the integrity side, I, you know, I, I think you could run a good system with photo ID and generally would be in favor of it. I think you have to do some things to, to make sure it's, um, you know, the, pe the people have accessibility and get past things. But more important than that even, I think is again, I'm gonna go back to the registration system. It's great to have an ID, but unless you have a really good list that's comprehensive and the ID connects with the list and we're up to date with, with the, who the person is, then even that ID isn't that great an integrity tool, right? It's, it's an integrity tool when you have a really good system and it's connected to these, these well done lists. So I, I think states are gonna have varieties of you know, forms of ID and they probably could do it well in one way or another, but finding a way to sort of more deeply think about the registration system and getting voters up to date and having some effective way, whether it's photo ID or some lesser form of ID to, to connect the voter with that, that list, I think can be done well uh, and you know, probably could be done better in some places. Yeah, and, and I'll add to that. I, look, I, I completely agree that um, both sides take that particular issue of photo ID to an extreme, right? And whenever I think we have a public policy question like this, it's always good to go back to first principles. And the first principle here is that all eligible voters should be registered to vote. That we should make it easy for all eligible voters to be registered to vote in a secure and safe way. Now, there can, we can argue about some of those, those details, but quite often, in, in my opinion, arguments around things like photo ID really become uh, methods to beat the other side up, right? Um, they become political wedges. And, and I don't think they necessarily have to be. I think everybody could agree in either party or all parties that if you're eligible to vote, we want you to register in a legal and secure way so that you can exercise your franchise. So I'll return to first principles and issues like that and work out the details. But too often, it gets into these extreme arguments, not intended to solve an actual problem, but to make a political point. Director Mara, anything to add? 
Um, not exactly voter ID, and, and maybe the professor can touch on that, the ERIC system throughout the states. We didn't talk about that, and not all states belong to that, but that's the electronic registration. So it's where we share data. Arizona is a member of that, but maybe touching on that real quick, and that's really kind of like a federal thing. We can't make other states do things. Um, and maybe it's a cost that is prohibitive, but, but if you share that data across state lines, that really helps. Yeah, just uh, briefly that, um, uh, again, this is dealing with the registration system, improving our registration system. The, the way I would describe it is, if you looked at us 25 years ago, we were kind of in the prehistoric age of re registration where most states didn't have a statewide list. Um, very few were computerized. Um, 2000, Bush v. Gore pushed us to have much better computerized statewide lists. They're not perfect, but they're, they're miles better than they used to be. One thing we don't do is we don't have a national list. We don't have a way of directly sharing um, between the states. But there is a very good voluntary program, and, and I was part of a commission, uh, the Bauer Ginsburg Commission, which, which really recommended more sharing between the states, and especially this ERIC program, which again, states can join, they don't have to, but it allows them to get information from other states to help them both identify people who aren't on the list who are eligible, but also people who uh, are duplicates or people who are dead or still on the list and allows states to both improve the comprehensiveness and uh, deal with the accuracy of the list. So it's a helpful tool. I think there are others. Uh, I think, again, keeping the registrations, getting people registered in the right way and in an effective way and then keeping them up to date is one of the most important things because that's an important tool that would be very helpful. And, and it kind of underlies the effectiveness of, of uh, having an ID because, again, hopefully those lists are connected to an ID pretty closely. Great. Thank you. Thanks for that question. Thank you. The question I wanted to raise is about the question of voter quality itself. You know, it's all well and good for people to vote, but if people aren't actually educated about candidates, policies, so on and so forth, what good really is the vote? So I wanted to ask you all what you think can perhaps be done to better educate voters so that not only are people going out to the polls and voting, but so that they're hopefully doing so with that in a manner that is truly civically engaged as opposed to, I which I feel, I think I can reasonably say is the worst case now, which is flagrant partisan voting on pure, near purely ideological grounds. Great, all right, Speaker Adams. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I did lose an election once and I'm sure it was voter quality. <laughs> um, I'm positive of that. Um, look, um, what I would say to your question is that living in a Republican form of government is a little bit messy. And let's embrace the messiness because the alternative is no bueno, right? The alternative is, is just not anything anybody in this room would want to be a part of. And, you know, again, having been on the ballot and campaigning personally or campaigning for other people, you know, sometimes you leave a room of voters and you go, what in the world are they thinking? Or what planet are they from, right? But that's the nature of a democratic society. So I do think that we can do some things at a larger scale, for example, things like this program, teaching civics in schools in a way that helps people understand and confront our system in a way they understand it, right? So I would say that what we, can we do to improve voter quality? Frankly, it would be to improve voter education from grade school on up about our government, what it means, how it works, how you participate in it, and, and generally the issues that affect it. And that, that's how I'd answer that question. Could I say, uh, going back to the very first point I made, um, one of the advantages, but also disadvantages of our system is that we vote on everything. And I, I, I tried to list all those offices and ballot questions, but you know, if you're in, in, the, in a basic parliamentary system in Europe, it's a little bit of an exaggeration, but there are countries where you might make three X's in a five-year period. You might vote for your parliamentary rep or the EU and won a local election, and that's it. You've made three X's. And you know, when you go into a ballot, and I like to think of myself as a educated voter, but occasionally you get down and you think, 
pick three for library trustee. And they don't have party names after them. And just going back to the party issue, it's a balance here, but political science has shown a party is information for voters. So occasionally you get there and you don't have any party and you look and what do you do and I should have had something. And so, so whether you want everything to be nonpartisan and have all these offices, I don't think we're going to change dramatically on this, but thinking a little bit more about you know, what you put in front of voters. There are also some more educational tools. I mean, I will know Oregon, for example, some of the um, Northwest states have very detailed voter guides and it, it goes with vote by mail. I, you know, maybe I see some disadvantages, but there are also some pluses where they, where they get a very detailed um, account from the candidates about the issues um, that can be helpful, but it is hard. I just think the big issues, the big candidates, we're gonna know, we're gonna have opinions, we're gonna have strong opinions, we're gonna have a lot of information. When you go down further, it's hard to get that information. Some of it you're just going to get by party, and some of it you just got to encourage people to, to know more. But it is a challenge of our system, even though there's some benefit from letting the people weigh in on all these things. Yeah, thank you. So I wanted to ask a professional thing as well, by the way. Um, <laughs> uh, not too much pressure. But again, I would love commentary from everyone. So. might not want to have voted for that candidate because of something they didn't know about that came up. So I'm not going to ask you for an optimal number of days, um, but what is the best way for legislators and people who think about these things to approach those dual issues of information and accessibility? Yeah, so I mean, uh, if I go back a little bit to my long history, so I can't write it off of being a little critical of voting by mail. That was one of the issues I certainly did raise. Um, I, w one thing to note is, aside from this last election, uh, yes, the period for voting by mail is often longer, and, and it has to be to some extent, or at least it has to be for some people. I mean, I think we've done some very good things about uh, getting overseas and, and, uh, and, and uniform military voters uh, who can vote and need lead time more so that, so that they should get their ballots earlier. Um, but one thing is people tended to vote their vote ballots a little later, even, even with all that. And even if I could say, well, the, ballot, the period's long, people tended to vote close to election day, drop them off in, 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 in drop boxes, or, or just to cast them in the last period. This last election, we saw really early voting, so it does worry a little bit. Uh, your, your point about primaries, um, yes, there are people who voted and then their candidates have dropped out. That's a, that's a difficulty. Um, on the question of early in-person voting, again, I've always been a big fan of early in-person voting. I think I, I like some of the advantages of the polling place and I think that can provide that. But there I think, you know, the research doesn't show that 50 days is better than 15 days or 10 days. And so I've always believed that a, a period of time, uh, not just one day of election day, but of you know, 10 days or so, including some weekend days, but in tents and with good locations and with longer hours at that period of time is better than just saying, hey, you can have as long as you want and we have these lousy locations and show up everywhere. So I, I guess I move, I'm not an election day person. I think that's really not very tenable for most states to say we're only election day or, or mostly. But I do think that, you know, we, there are ways, especially in the early in-person voting of sort of making an intense 10-day period that are that are just as good. Um, voting by mail does require some some lead time on, on both ends, and I, you know I think on the other side, I think we've we've all emphasized that you know, it might be helpful to to be able to get that ballot in by election day. And I know some places like to let it come in later. I I believe it's better to, to you know, get going and make sure we can get as much counted as possible. Um, you know that's another aspect of it, but. I think you're right, there are some challenges. Usually voters aren't voting as early as they were last time, so maybe not as bad as you're worried about, but you know, it is, it is, there are some concerns there. Any thoughts, Director Mara? 
It's a great question, and uh, it, that comes up all the time at the legislatures with, um, you know, do we do the postmark? If it's postmarked, we do it. If we don't have them by 7 o'clock election day, they're not counted, right? So um, I, I've been, I think I've said very clearly that I've been voting by mail for 30 years because it was important to me. I was a young mother, I worked, I was always like, voting was so important. What if, what if I shared a car with my husband? What if I couldn't get the car? What if I couldn't get out of work? So I was like, so important when I was like 19, right? Like now, so important. But what if the kids were sick and I couldn't vote? I, I, so I was like, I would like hyperventilate about it. I was so that I voted by mail. And, and I always thought, if I voted and I sent it in, the candidate was my candidate when I voted for them. If they drop out the next day, that's on them. That's not on me. So um, I think the thing is we do have to look at the lead time on both ends, especially in rural Arizona. I I'm in rural Arizona. We used to process mail through Tucson. Now all mail goes to Phoenix. So you mail something in Cochise County, it goes to Phoenix and then comes back. So we could have a, a five day turnaround, seven day if there's a holiday in there. Election mail is prioritized by the Postal Service. They do a great job, but um, there are lots of solutions we could look at. And things like this are so helpful because we all have the conversation and people that are watching it live stream or that watch it later can have ideas too. So thanks for that question. Um, different parts of the country, great question, do things differently. In Arizona, we have um, either precinct voting or vote center, where you can vote anywhere and they can pull up your ballot style. So those are important things. If A lot of times we get several thousand, Maricopa probably gets 40,000, I don't know, it's just a number, uh, of ballots dropped off. So it would show that that's 100% that was sent out, but they have to be signature verified before we can count them. So that's part of the, the lag in there. To address your question about not being an election expert, neither am I. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm just here because the professor is an election expert <laughs> and the speaker. Um, sign up to be a poll worker. That's the best advice I could give anybody. About my second year at the county, I worked for the Board of Supervisors and we were short some poll workers. So the county administrator came in and he said, guess what, you're gonna be the inspector at a poll station. I'm like, I have no idea what that means, what I do, and, and it is life changing. So do that, sign up. If you're in Maricopa County, they need a lot of people and they'll pay you. So they'll train you, but do the early boards, do the provisional boards, get involved with that because it is life changing. And then you can go out there and defend some of the really great laws we have in Arizona. Thank you. Can I, I just want to second that. I think being a poll worker is a great, no, 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 you don't have to stay anymore, but I just, uh, <laughs> um, you know, people talk about civic things they can do and jury duty and I, you know, that's one thing that goes way back, but being a poll worker or just being a volunteer and part of running the elections is a great public service. Very educational too, but I think it's something that you can do that's both good for your community, but it's good for yourself as a citizen, so I'm, I'm all for it. Okay, we have one more. Hi, this is the speaker. Adam mentioned uh, that people would often get the ballots mailed to them and then deliver them in person and like on election day. And I was just wondering how common that is, because it seems like you know, how is that counted? Is it kind of as a mailing vote, even though it's really done in person, that sort of thing? Well, I think the director was, be you mentioned there may be several thousand in Cochise County alone are dropped off at the polls on election day. Um, that number in Maricopa County can be 200,000. Okay. So what that means is when those ballots get dropped off, they're still, they still have to go through the signature verification process. Now, imagine if you have a very close election, like we did in 2020, not only for president, but also for many down ballot races. Mm -hmm. And there are 200,000 ballots out there, and you don't know exactly as the public what precincts they may come from or what districts they come from. So it creates a lot of um, anxiety about the results of the election, especially if you're a candidate and you're on the losing side, mm -hmm. and there's 200,000 ballots out there, right? So. 
in, in my view, there must be some things that we can do about that. Perhaps it is s no longer allowing you to drop off a ballot on election day, but instead you exchange it for an in-person ballot and vote with the machine. There may be ways that we can change that so that we can shrink the time frame um, of getting these election results. Great. Thanks. We have quickly one more minute, and then I must turn it back to Dr. Carice, but by all means, we want to hear from you. Time's up. So. <laughs> <laughs> Bomb at the end. Um, I, I would say that I would liken the Arizona uh, audit to an abstract painting. It could mean whatever you want it to mean, depending upon the perspective that you come from, right? And so I'm a big believer in all public policy of not questioning the motives of those you disagree with, right? So I'm not going to do that. But what I will say is that um, the, as I understand it from President Karen Fan of the State Senate, the original purpose of the audit was to vet out the various conspiracy theories that had been promulgated and theories about why the election turned out the way it did and to see if there was any veracity to them. And at the end of the day, again, it's my understanding that the audit concluded that Joe Biden won Arizona legitimately and legally, all right? Now, some who may have gone into that process of the audit wanting a different outcome still are not happy with that and still have issues and things that they want to talk about. Um, but the audit showed that Joe Biden won Arizona in the same way that um, uh, other audits have shown similar results. So you, I think you get what you're looking for when it comes to the Arizona audit. I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. We'll be available afterwards if folks have other questions. I want to thank all of our esteemed panelists and all of you for taking the time to participate in this conversation tonight. Dr. Carice, we are turning it back to you. I think our labors here are concluded. Thank you so much. Uh, just before we thank the panel, um, obviously thank you for attending. We hope you will stay for a reception. There's information outside about uh, the Arizona Chamber fellows program and on your your seats as information about our school uh, it's it's undergraduate curriculum it's graduate uh, program our speakers program uh, speaking of civic education you can pick up our distinctive US pocket Constitution which adds Martin Luther King was was uh, referenced which adds uh, Lincoln's Gettysburg address and Martin Luther King's I have a dream address to the Declaration and the Constitution and we also have the only in the history of Arizona, the only Arizona pocket constitution, the essential Arizona pocket constitution. Pick up all that, and and more, and and you know, you can also get an Abraham Lincoln squishy toy, <laughs> if 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 you want, for those stressful election officials who might need to squeeze something. Uh, I've I've been asked by uh, Joe Pitts to say um, thanks to various people. I, I do want to say thank you to the team in Skettle, uh, Dr. Carol McNamara our Associate Director of Public Programs, uh, and our events team, Marlene especially, but the student workers we have. Uh, thanks again to the partnership with the Arizona uh, Chamber of Commerce and Industry for this series. A special thanks to the Arizona Junior Fellows themselves, uh, a, uh, a program of the chamber. It should be noted that Eileen Klein is, is one of the architects of that, um, to Joe Pitts and other students who helped to organize this whole program. Uh, and, and Joe wants me to particularly thank a group of people, um, uh, lawyers and uh, 
scholars and community leaders who assisted the fellows in doing some research for this whole program, including Josh Sellers, professor at the O'Connor College of Law, Eric Spencer from Snell and Wilmer, Scott Bales, the former Chief Justice of the Arizona Supreme Court, and uh, some guy named Stephen Richer uh, from Maricopa County Recorder. Oh, there he is, yes. There he's uh, and also to thank Blake Wilson uh, for providing photography and commotion studios for the AV services. Um, as was mentioned earlier, Dr. Fortier is speaking tomorrow night, uh, at, tomorrow at 4 p.m. here in this same building, uh, just down the hall, Memorial Union, room 246, uh, for an event organized by the American Enterprise Institute Student Club on campus. Uh, that's at 4 p.m. and the discussion is on the Electoral College. And please spread the word about that and ev anybody and everybody is welcome to attend. So with that, we hope you will stay for the reception and please join me once again in thanking this extraordinary panel. <laughs>